Hey guys, it's awesome to be back with you again tonight and I'm live, but I just wanted to let you know um, I'm not going to be taking questions tonight because it's just easier for me to do it this way, live stream it instead of record a video, edit it, and then upload it because it just takes forever, especially lately YouTube seems like it's taking forever to upload my videos. So I'm just going to live stream. So if I mess up and there are mistakes, just understand that this is live. But if you're watching this at a later date, today is Tuesday, September 29th, 8.25 p.m. If you're watching this at a later date, just understand you are now watching a recording and it is no longer live. But as of right now, this time I just mentioned, I am live. Okay, so I just want to say really quick, um, the purpose, the reason that I do these videos and that God has put it on my heart to do these videos is to, for two reasons. One, to encourage the body of Christ, to encourage the church, the believers. And two is to warn the world and point them to Jesus so that they can be saved. That's why I do these videos. Um, so let's get into it. The topic for tonight is the bride, the tribulation saints, and patient endurance. And I'm going to be going over them in that order. So... Um, let's get into it. And I'm sure there's probably a lot of people right now watching the debates instead of watching YouTube, but that's totally fine. Um, this is what God has called me do, to do tonight. So that's what I'm doing. All right. So like I said, we're talking about the bride, the tribulation saints and patient endurance in that order. So let's start with the bride. And this first part really has to do with um, my dream that I just recently had. If you haven't seen that, go click here. Um, this will be up here later once the video is no longer live. I'll also put the link in the description. But um, I had a dream about a Jewish wedding just a few nights ago. And it was absolutely amazing to me. Um, I very rarely dream. There was so much symbolism in the dream. And um, please go watch that video because it really blessed me. And I believe God gave it to me to bless the church. But I was just reading some scriptures today and it really stuck out to me because it confirmed and edified the dream that I just recently had about this Jewish wedding. And I wanted to share it with you. Um, and if you've already already seen my dream, you'll you'll get how cool this is. But if you haven't, please go watch it. So speaking about the bride. Um, I'm going to start with Revelation 3, 10 through 13. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance. Keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that later. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. That is the tribulation. We're going to be kept from that. To try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Guys, God is still coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. You know, a lot of people accuse me and other men and women like me who encourage people to look for Christ. They accuse us, they accuse us of, of giving people false hope. And I'm not giving people false hope, and neither are others who are looking for Jesus' return, because it says right here, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. And that is exactly what I and all the other watchmen and women are saying. Jesus is coming soon. Hold fast to your faith. And if you don't have faith, you don't have a relationship with Christ. Now is the time. Okay, so there's no giving people false hope. We're looking for his soon return. Yes, there are high, high watch times, but I'm not setting a date. Others are not setting dates. They're hoping for dates, but we don't know. We can't say for sure if it will be on this day and this hour, we look and we watch and we wait for him and we hold fast because he says, I am coming soon. So just a little quick note there. Now let's read the rest of that scripture. In verse 12, it says, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God. This is so cool. Remember in my dream, this is so cool. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. 
And guys, if you if you saw my dream, the bride in my dream had this white garment on her that was covered with new names. All I knew it was is it was new names on her and permanent marker, but I couldn't read them. But they were new names on her white garment. And here it says in Revelation 3, this is like one of my very favorite verses. I quote it all the time about, you know, hold fast so that no one seizes your crown. I am coming soon. I will keep you from the hour of trial. And But the, right here after it, it says in the same chapter, I will write three new names on him, on you, on us, the bride, the body of Christ. I will write the name of my God, the name of the holy city, Jerusalem, and my own new name. And that was just beautiful for me to see that today because it's, it's such a confirmation of my dream. And I really had not realized this part of the scripture until today. And it just jumped out at me because of the dream that God gave me. And here, even later in the same chapter, guess what it mentions? Watch this. Revelation 3, 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. That is so cool because in my dream, it was a white garment that she was wearing and it was so beautiful and clean and white and it had those new names on it. And this is exactly what God shows us in scripture. So for me, this is so encouraging to see this. And not only that, you know, in my dream, the bride had tattoos on her. And I felt like God was showing me that it was a symbol that she was somewhat of the world, that she'd been marked by the world. You know, a lot of us have been scarred by this world. We've been damaged by this world. We've had hard times in this world. Um, and we're also... A lot of the church is Gentile. And, um, but it was, she was, those things were covered by this white garment that had new names on it. And, you know, in scripture, the Bible shows us, we can see clearly, and even just looking at history, the bride of Christ, we are the bride of Christ, the church, everyone since Jesus came, um, were mostly Gentile. And the bride of Christ is shown or typified in the Bible as a Gentile bride. And, you know, it's, it's obvious. Since Jesus came and brought the gospel, the majority of Christians are not Jews. The Jews still have blindness in part until they come to their salvation, which they will, during the Great Tribulation. But in majority, the bride of Christ is a Gentile, a Gentile bride. Now, in Christ, of course, there is no Jew or Gentile. And I do not preach replacement theology. I'll get into that later in this lesson. I absolutely do not agree with replacement theology. The Jews are still God's people. But the bride of Christ is typically shown as a Gentile bride in, in biblical typology. In fact, please click on up here or in the description later below. I have a video called The Pre-Tribulation Rapture is the Truth. And I go through and show um, example after example after example of how the bride of Christ is typified as a Gentile bride. And that's exactly what we see has happened in history. You know, the majority of the body of church are Gentiles. They're not Jews. And that's why the, body, the Bible says, you know, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then the rapture will happen. And then God turns his focus back to the, the, Israel, the people of Israel. And they will be saved through the tribulation. So, um, and of course, I had a lot of people mentioned to me uh, this movie or this documentary, I guess it's a film, called Before the Wrath, done by Brent Miller. And I absolutely have seen it. It's beautiful. It's about the Galilean wedding. Jesus was from Galilee. And yes, he was a Jew. He was from Galilee. And um, you can, I'll put that link in the description in the comments later to this film called Before the Wrath. It's on Amazon. Um, I'm not making any money from from you renting it, but you can go and rent it. And it's I highly recommend it. It's really, really well done. But it shows you how the picture of the Galilean wedding was God speaking to us this whole time about how all of this was going to be like a Galilean wedding. And it's beautiful. You know, the the bride comes and he pays a price. The groom comes, sorry, and he pays a price for the bride. 
Then he goes away to his father's house to prepare a place for the bride. And then he comes at an hour she doesn't expect with the cry of a trumpet. And he lifts her up off of the ground and takes her to the wedding ceremony. And then the doors are shut. And if you didn't go with the bride and groom into the wedding, then you were shut out. It's just a beautiful picture. So I do recommend going and watching that film. So now let's get into some scriptures about how we are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. For some reason, there's a lot of confusion out there on this topic. And so I want to go through some scriptures tonight and we'll just nail it down and make it really clear because thank God, God has given us his word and it is so clear. So we are the bride of Christ, the church. And let's look at proof of that in the scripture. Revelation 19, six through eight is where we're going to start. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out. Hallelujah. For the Lord, our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for pay attention here. The marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So clearly here you can see the marriage of the lamb, which is Jesus Christ, is to the bride who is clothed in fine linen, white and pure. And it is, who is it? It's the saints, the righteous deed, deeds of the saints. That's what that linen is representing. So it's the church. The church is the bride of Christ. It's right here in the Bible. Now let's also read um, <coughs> Revelation 19 14 through 16 because this shows the bride of christ the saints the church returning with christ at the end of the tribulation because guys the pre-tribulation rapture is the truth of the scripture we get raptured before the tribulation and we come back with christ at the end of the tribulation and we can see that here in, in Revelation 19, 14 through 16. It says, and the armies of heaven, and who are these armies of heaven? Arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses, following Jesus. We just read right here, what is the fine linen, white and pure? It's what the bride is wearing. It is the righteous deeds of the saints. Okay, this is speaking of the bride following Jesus. And it says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this is when, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to put an end to the Antichrist and the beast. He's going to have Satan thrown into the pit and locked up for a thousand years, and he will set up his thousand year reign. On earth. And so, and he's going to destroy the, the ungodly, those who were fighting with the beast and on the beast's side. So clearly, it's a picture of Christ coming back to set up his kingdom. This is called the millennial reign, which will be the final thousand years of human history. Um, and it'll be when the church comes back with Jesus. Now, there's another scripture that even more clearly affirms this and confirms this so in case you're still confused um that zechariah 14 3 through 9 makes it even more clear then shall the lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought on the day of battle so again this is the scene that it's setting here is jesus coming back at the end of the tribulation to put a stop to the beast the antichrist and his armies and his feet, now get this, Jesus is not in the clouds, he's landing on the earth, because it's a, this is a separate thing from the rapture, which is us meeting Jesus in the clouds and going to be with him. This is Jesus coming with us and landing on the earth. So it says, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, that's in Jerusalem. It says, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst of thereof toward the east and toward the west and there shall be a great valley 
and half the mountains shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, you shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Now, get this. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with him. So, right here. Let's just stop right there. It's saying at the end, Jesus is coming back to put a stop to the ungodly, to the Antichrist. And it says, and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with him. The church, the bride of Christ, just like what we read just previous in Revelation 19. It's as clear as day, guys. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your word. It's so beautiful. And then it continues and says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter it shall be, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Again, that's the millennial reign. You know, in that day, God is, Jesus is literally going to be king over the, all the earth for a thousand years. It's going to be a beautiful time. Now, I hope that's made it very clear for you guys that the bride of Christ is the church and we are coming back with Christ at the end of the tribulation. Um, now, there is some confusion amongst some people who think that Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, is the bride of Christ. And that's not what the Bible says. And here's where they get their confusion from. It's from Revelation 21, 1 through 3. And I wanted to address it. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It is not saying that the heavenly city Jerusalem is the bride. It's saying it's prepared as a bride for her husband. It's prepared for Jesus like a bride. But the bride is the church, not the city. It's not saying Jerusalem is the bride. Okay, so don't get confused there. And then continues and says, I heard a loud voice from the son from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. So are there Jews and Gentiles in the church? Yes, absolutely. The Bible says in Galatians 3.28 that in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile. We're all one in Christ. So, of course, there are Jewish people and Gentiles in the church. But again, like I said, it's very clear if you just look at history up until this present day, the majority of the church is Gentile. It's not majority Jewish. So that's why the Bible typifies the bride of Christ and all the types and shadows in the Old Testament as a Gentile bride. It makes perfect sense. Now, so, now the nation of Israel, let me make this clear, the nation of Israel are still God's chosen people and always will be. I firmly stand against replacement theology, and that is people who say, the church has completely replaced Israel and that Israel is nothing to God and the church actually now is Israel. That is not scriptural at all. And I will show you that here in just a second. But I just want you to know I do not stand for that or agree with that. The bride is a separate thing from Israel. And Israel absolutely still is God's chosen people. And he has a plan and a future for them. That's the whole point of the tribulation, guys. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah. And the whole point of it, it says, he shall be saved out of it. He shall be saved through it. The tribulation is to bring the Jewish people to their knees and finally say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and accept Jesus as their Messiah. And they will, because the Bible says they will. So let's read Jeremiah 31, 35 through 36, which completely proves without a doubt, that the people of Israel are always going to be God's chosen people. And they're not the bride, but they will always be God's chosen people. 
Now, can Jewish people be the bride? Yes, we just went over that. But let's read this about the nation of Israel, okay? Jeremiah 31, 35 through 36. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. That's it right, guy, right there, guys. That's all I need to hear. And that should be all you need to hear. The church has not replaced Israel. Israel has not disappeared in God's eyes because last time I looked, there's still a sun and a moon and stars and an ocean. And God says, if you can get rid of those things, then Israel will cease to be a nation before me forever. How long is forever? Forever, you know? So um, it can't be any more clear from God's word right there. So, you know, um, some people, this is one last note I want to make on the bride. Some people get confused and they think Israel is the bride and they don't understand the difference between the old and the new covenants. And that's why they have this confusion. And this is something that we can get into at a later date. We don't have time for that right now in this video, but that's where that confusion comes in. Um, so just understand that it's, that's what, where the confusion is the old covenant versus the new covenant. Okay, so that is the bride part. Now let's talk about the tribulation saints. And this is really encouraging because this shows you in scripture, the tribulation saints are separate from the bride of Christ. They're not the church. The, 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 the scripture can't be any more clear. You know, again, we read Revelation 3.10 earlier. It says, because of your patient endurance, I will keep you out of the hour of trial that is to come upon the whole earth. Speaking of the tribulation, the church will not be here for the tribulation. Now, a lot of people get confused because the Bible talks about saints dying during the tribulation. And those are the tribulation saints who are a separate entity from the church, from the bride. And the scripture makes that clear. So let's look at it. Revelation 7, 13 through 17 is where we're going to start. And this talks about the tribulation saints. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them in his presence. They shall hunger no more neither thirst any more, the, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So right there, it's telling you who the tribulation saints are. Now, you might have noticed that first part of the scripture talks about them wearing white robes. Don't confuse that with being the church. We're about to read another scripture that shows you clearly that they are a separate thing from the church, okay? But they also get white robes. And it says, you know, they have washed their robes white in the blood and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So in the tribulation, guys, you can still um, find salvation. You can still have a hope of eternal life, but it is a different relationship. It's not like it is now where you can just accept Jesus, believe on him, and get saved, and know that when Jesus comes, you're raptured. And, and no matter what happens to you, if you die, you're going straight to heaven, okay? This, it's going to be more like an Old Testament relationship, where you have to follow God and choose God. You're going to have to reject in the tribulation. You're going to have to reject the mark of the beast. You're, you probably are going to get martyred and killed for your faith. And you're going to have to go through all these plagues and horrible judgment that God is going to pour out on the earth. And you, you might probably die in those. So if you have faith in God and unto the end, whether it's death or you make it through tribulation, that's how you find salvation in the tribulation. It's very different now. Right now, you simply believe on Christ. And the moment you die, you're with him. And when he comes, you go with him and into the clouds to be with him before the tribulation. 
So just understand that. And it, it, the cool thing here is it's in verse 16, it specifically talks about um, how they won't go through things anymore, which they will have gone through in the tribulation. Because it's talking about the tribulation saints. It says, they shall hunger no more. In the tribulation, there's going to be great famines. Read the book of Revelations. A revelation before, um, let's see, starting in verse, in chapter four on, um, you'll see famines. Famines come. And it says, neither thirst anymore. Remember, God's going to turn tons, like a third of the water into blood. And, and there's this thing called wormwood that's going to hit the earth and it's going to create tons of the water is going to be um, toxic. So there's, there's going to be great thirst. And it says the sun shall not strike them nor, nor any scorching heat. And also it talks about in the tribulation, there's going to be the sun is going to scorch people and burn people and burn the earth. So, you know, this is a, this is a verse for hope for those who are going through the tribulation because they're going to be experiencing these things. And Jesus wants them to know right here, they can have robes of white washed in the blood of the lamb and they will no longer go through hunger or thirst or scorching heat. And it says for the lamb will be in the midst, uh, um, will be their shepherd in their midst and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Guys, these people are going to go through a horrible time, but God is giving them hope here. Okay. It's a beautiful thing. Now to make it very clear that even though they have white robes, they are separate from the church. Let's read Revelation 20, 4 through 6, and this makes it abundantly clear. Then I saw thrones, and on them were those, and sorry, and seated on them were those to whom authority to judge was committed. All right, let's stop right there. That is the church. The Bible expressly and clearly says that Jesus will give authority to the church to rule and reign with him and authority to judge will be given to us. We will be priests and kings with God and his kingdom. Okay, so this clearly, specifically is speaking about the church. And, you know, even uh, I think it was Paul or Peter, I, can't I think it was Paul, he says, do, you know, if you, why do you guys think you're not able to work out differences amongst yourselves and judge amongst yourselves? Do you not, do you not know that you will even judge angels in the time that is to come, you're going to be judges. So this is speaking about the church. Okay. Just understand that. And then it says, continuing on in this script, in the scripture also. So now it's talking about another set of people. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. That is the tribulation saints. They are going to have to go through the uh, tribulation, probably get martyred. They're going to have to reject the mark of the beast and they're not going to be, they cannot worship the beast, the image of the beast. So right here at the beginning of this scripture, you can see you've got the thrones, those who are seated on them, who have the authority to judge. This is the church without a doubt. And also he saw the tribulation saints, those who had been beheaded and who had not worshipped the beast. Two separate entities, completely separate, right there in, in the scripture. And then let's continue. It says, um, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So at the end of the tribulation, those who have chosen Christ during the tribulation were martyred for him, whatever, died for him, made it through. But the ones who have died will come back to life at that point. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him a thousand years. Now, right there, there's another part where a lot of confusion sets in. And that is where it says, this is the first resurrection. Now, that's absolutely true, but you have to understand the harvest in the Bible. The Bible has made it abundantly clear. The harvest, the resurrection is the harvest. The harvest is a threefold harvest. 
So you, you've got to understand this concept to get this. When every year, when you are an agricultural society, when you grow things, you grow crops, you have a harvest. So let's say it was your first year to be a farmer and you had a harvest and you, this is, you would say, this is my first harvest, my first resurrection, okay? You have to understand God ordained three sections or three parts to a harvest. It was all prophecy. It was all types and shadows. And even Paul speaks about this in Corinthians. It's a, he says, each in his own order, Christ at his first fruits, then we who are alive and remain at his coming, and then the end shall come. That is when Christ comes back at the end with us and the tribulation saints raise at that point. There's three parts to the harvest. So please click here later once this video is no longer live or down in the description and I'll link my video. It's called, uh, I believe, Pentecost and the Rapture, I believe is the name of it. But the whole video is about the threefold harvest. Um, also, Ty Green has done a video on this subject or maybe several. And brother, if you see this video, maybe you could link it in the comments. Um, I just can't think of a particular video to link, but I know Ty Green has done busy videos on this that are very well done. So I'd encourage you to go watch that. But that's why people get all tripped up when they read this. This is the first resurrection. They don't understand that the resurrection has three parts. And that is, was Jesus when he was resurrected from the dead and went to, to God after he was crucified. And then that the next will be us at his coming. And then third will be the tribulation saints who raised from the dead at the end of the um, tribulation, at the beginning of the millennium. So I hope that helps clear some confusion for some people. All right, so now I want to get to the encouraging part for all of you guys, and that is patient endurance. Um, God said we would think that he's going to be late, okay? So if you're feeling right now that God is running late, that he hasn't showed up when you expected him, just understand the Bible knew that would happen, and the Bible tells us very clearly about that here in the scriptures. And that's why God gave us his word to encourage us because he wanted us to see that he has it under control and he knew we would be feeling this way. Um, I want to thank my brother, Barry Awe, who brought up this scripture the other day. And it really brought it to my attention because it's a beautiful scripture. It's one I'm going to start with here in this section. And that is Habakkuk 2 verse one through three. And it says, I will stand upon my watch. So right here, we're talking about watching, you know, the watchmen, all of you guys who are watching for Jesus to come back. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come and not tarry. So that's not a contradiction right there, guys. It's saying at the end we'll understand it. It's not a lie. God did not lie to us, guys. And it says, though it tarry, so though it seems like it's taking a long time, though it seems like God is running late, wait for it. Because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. It will not be late. So even though we may have a feeling that God is running late, wait for it. Have patience. Because he will surely come, and he's not going to be late. He's coming in his perfect timing, guys. It's going to be exactly when he knew he was going to come, and it's going to be the perfect time to come. So just understand, we're not God. Don't put your hope in anyone on YouTube. Don't put your hope in any calculation that you've done or some other person has done. Our hope should be in Christ, in Christ alone. And just understand, he's got it under control. 
And he knew that we would be watching and think he was running late, but he's not running late. He said, wait, and he's going to come exactly at the right time. It's a beautiful scripture. So let's read some more that just continue to make this clear to us and encourage us. Um, James 5, 7 through 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. God knew we would need this, guys. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So understand, guys, God is allowing the early rain and the late rain. He is a patient father. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. Okay. So understand God is giving time for as many as possible to be saved. He has a time appointed that he's going to come for us. We have to have patience. It says, you also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So no one is giving you false hope when they tell you the coming of the Lord is at hand. Okay. It is. The Bible says so but we're going to have to have patience. Understand that. Um, let's read Revelation 3.10 through 11. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the whole earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Again, right here, it's, the scripture is admonishing us, us to be patient. We're going to have to have patient endurance. He says, I am coming. I am going to keep you from the tribulation. I'm going to keep the church out of the tribulation. And he says, hold fast so that no one may seize your crown. Hold fast to your faith right now, guys. Hold fast. Do not let your faith die. Your faith is in Christ and he has it under control. He's coming. Matthew 24 45 through 50. And this is this is going to be an example of those whose faith is probably in the wrong thing. And they begin to attack their brothers and sink back into the world when it looks like God isn't coming back when they thought he would. Don't be that person. Please, I beg you. Now let's read the scripture. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give him their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know. So again, right there, we can see the faithful and wise servant will be giving people the word of God at the proper time. Guys, when we see that day approaching, it's time to preach the gospel. It's time to bring in the harvest because the fields are ripe. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord finds so doing when he returns. Okay. But it says, don't be that wicked servant who thinks that God is delayed and begins to attack his brothers and sink back into the world because that person is going to be the person that is caught off guard when God comes back. Don't be that person. Now let's read another scripture, Matthew 25, one through seven. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise for when the, now already you can see this is a wedding picture, which is beautiful. Again, it's all a Galilean wedding such a beautiful picture. Um, for when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom, Jesus, was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, at a very late time, at a very late hour, at the end of the day, for, for those of us who are Gentile, for a Jew, it's, it's not necessarily the end of the day, but at a late hour, but at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. 
Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. So here we can clearly see, okay, a wedding picture. And the bridegroom was taking a long time. And everyone got sleepy and fell asleep. But at a very late hour, there was a cry. And they, the virgins woke up. But only five had oil for their lamps and five did not. Okay, so God knew that we would feel like he's running late and that we would get drowsy. But we've got to be watching and waiting and listening, guys. Um, let's read. This, is, this ties in with that scripture. Let's read Luke 12. 37 through 40. Blessed are those servants, sorry, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third, that's like midnight to 3 a.m., and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So right there again we see, you know, it's going to be tempting to just fall back asleep, to just fall back into the world. Don't do that. It says, at a very late hour, you know, if he comes in the second watch, 12 a.m., or the third watch, 3 a.m., and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. He, he, the Bible told us we're going to feel like Jesus is running late. Stay awake. Keep watching. Keep looking. He is coming. He said so. Um, let's read another scripture, Luke 18, 6 through 8. And the Lord said, Hear what the righteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know, right there we see, is God going to delay very long? It looks like he's, we're going to feel like he's delaying. But he's not. He's coming in his perfect time. He says, I tell you, he will give them justice speedily. Nevertheless, will the Son of Man come, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Guys, when Jesus comes back, will he find us having faith? Will he find us still believing, still watching, still hoping, having patient endurance, holding on to the hope of our salvation? Let it be. Let it be that we have faith when Jesus comes back, that he finds us faithful. He finds us awake. Let's be the faithful servant. Let's be the uh, wise virgins with oil in our lamp. Amen? Um, and then let's read another scripture here, Hebrews 10, 35 through 39. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while. It's going to be a little while. And the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Yet a little while, guys, yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. Let's have faith. Let's have faith. Don't lose faith. Don't lose faith. Hold fast. Remember in Revelation 3.10, it says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth. Hold fast so that no one may seize your crown. Have faith, hold fast. Um, I want to end with this scripture, Revelation twenty two seventeen, and the the spirit and the bride say, "Come," and let the one who hears say, "Come," and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Guys, 
the Holy Spirit through the church, the bride, is crying out right now for Jesus to come. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And the Bible says, let the one who is thirsty, let me read that scripture, let the one who desires take water, the water of life without price. Guys, if you need to get saved, if you want to have a relationship with Jesus, if you want to know the way, the truth, and the life, you can do it without price. It is a free gift. The gift of salvation is a free gift. It's time for you to get saved if you are not saved. How do you get saved? You believe that Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for your sins, that he died on the third day, he was, he was buried, and on the third day, he rose again. He rose to the right hand of the Father, that Jesus is who he says he is, and that is God. Believe on him, it says, for all who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And I will place some scriptures um, in the comments down below. I'll pin them in the top. I'll put them in the description, how to get saved. Guys, it's so simple. Don't let people trick you into thinking you have to, don't let the, the devil trick you into thinking that you have to clean yourself up somehow before you come to Christ. Come as you are, as you are with, with everything, all the luggage, all the damage that you have, come running to Christ. Fall at the feet of the cross. Lay your burdens at his feet and say, Jesus, pray with me if you want to get saved. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you are the son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you shed your blood to pay the price for my sins. I believe, I believe that you rose again on the third day and that you are in heaven and that you are coming back. That is the hope of our salvation. Jesus return for us so that we may be receive the, redemption, the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Lord, we look forward to that day. I believe that you are coming. I believe that you say you are. You, you are who you say you are. Jesus, save me. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I believe on you. I will follow you. I will give the rest of my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you for being here with me tonight. Um, I'm, I'm, like I said, this is live right now, but I'm just doing it because it's much easier and quicker for me to do a live than it is to record a video and then edit it and then upload it. I just li I live out in the country. It takes forever to upload videos. But um, anyways, I'm not going to be doing question and answer tonight, but I see all, a lot of you guys here in the comments. Um, God bless all of you. I love you. Be encouraged. Hold on to your faith. And I will talk to you soon. God bless.